Can food really be sexy? Well, of course it can. There's a number of ways food can be sexy. How you eat the food. Today I'm going to show you a Caesar salad that's a whole leaf that's eaten out of hand. No silverware at all. I think that's sexy. A panna cotta silken in texture. The texture itself is sexy. Brodetto di mare, the seafood, scallops and shrimp, everything eaten with your hand, feeding each other. Because what I'm doing today is dinner for my girl. And you're going to see just the menu I chose for it. Michael Chiarella's Napa is funded by Salton, innovative products for a healthy today and tomorrow. Featuring a full line of Breadman machines to make artisan breads for use in your own home. Salton, we'll bring out the baker in you. By Sunkist, fresh citrus taste, cooking with Sunkist throughout the day. Sunkist. Our promise, your inspiration. By All Clad Metal Crafters. All Clad is bonded construction. All Clad is functional design. All Clad is professional equipment. All Clad is a state of mind. And by Wolf, makers of ovens, cooktops, and ranges to fuel a passion for cooking. Caesar salad, what's created the phenomenon that's just swept across the nation? You can't go to a burger joint on the corner without seeing a Caesar salad on the menu. Well, you know what? The history of Caesar salad is kind of mixed. You hear all kinds of different stories. But the one I like is that there's this hotel in Tijuana back in the days, like the 40s, when you bought a hotel room with the American plan, you guys remember that? Are you old enough to remember an American plan? Where with your room rate, you also got lunch, dinner, breakfast, you know, a cabana boy to hand you a towel. Anything else that went with your day was all included. Well, on this one dreadful weekend, at the end of the weekend on Sunday night, when all the turistas would normally go home, there was a storm that came and nobody could fly out, nobody could drive out. But the problem is the hotel would be closed for three days. So there was no food left in the entire hotel, and the chef and the owner had to feed everybody. So what did he do? He went into the walk-in. He found some eggs. He found some lettuce, some mustard, some basic pantry things like we talk about all the time. He opened his pantry up and created an amazing salad dressing with great drama right in the middle of the dining room. So he was the floor show right, and the meal at the same time. Since that time, the legends continue to grow to have it as we had today. Very, very simple to make the dressing. You want to start, because it's a, such a mayonnaise-based technique, you want to start with a warm egg. These are a little bit cool, and I'll show you a little bit of a trick if that ever happens to you. A room temperature egg is much ba better to make a dressing from, because it emulsifies much better. I have a little boiling water for my next recipe. Coddling an egg means just to put it into some warm water for a couple of minutes. So obviously, we want no egg whites, just egg yolks. Oh, that's better temperature. That's great. The egg yolk's going to go right into the blender. Now, when you're making an emulsion, you need a little bit of acid. So the acid you want in at the beginning. What the acid does is it goes around kind of the protein and the fat as they emulsify together and protects it. Makes it a little more stable. If you ever make it a dressing and it's separated on you. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of balsamic vinegar just to make it a little Italiano. Chopped garlic. I like lots of garlic. I like to taste garlic in this. You have to think that romaine is 95% water. So you need a really powerful dressing here, one that's going to say, hello, you've arrived. Anchovies. We've turned them into a little bit of a paste. An anchovy, I think people sometimes say, oh, I don't need anchovies. I don't need Caesar salad. Can I get my Caesar salad without any anchovies in it? Well, the answer is no. You know why? because you need some Worcestershire, Worcestershire sauce in it. And this is made from anchovies. A little bit of that goes in. Obviously salt and pepper. Now you don't need as much salt because some Parmigiano is going to go into this at the very end. And dried cheeses by their nature have a little bit of salt in them. 
Dijon mustard. Now mustard's an emulsifier also. If you're ever making a dressing from like a Dijon vinaigrette, if you want a creamy dressing, you know, take an egg yolk and some mustard and whisk in some acid and then, uh, and then whisk in some olive oil and uh, it'll be nice, nicely emulsified. Okay, I think we have everything in there. There we have it. Now, what we serve with Caesar salad is romaine lettuce. Now, romaine, as I was saying before, is a fine lettuce that's very high in water, so you want to be careful. The parts of the romaine that I don't like are the very outside leaves. They just don't have a good enough flavor. We're going to take a whole leaf. All we're going to do is cut the core out of these guys and leave the leaves whole as they are right now. And there you have it. That should be enough. Now, croutons. What I do, use this bread knife, saw nicely. I like crostini like this to be, to be good size. Sometimes even I'll take and do them, you know, lengthwise. And you do a big old crostino like this, what they look like, they get a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of garlic, and a little bit of parmigiano, and that's it. These are perfect. And these store just fine. I mean, you get a week on these, you get a couple weeks on these. Let them cool, put them in a Ziploc bag, and everybody's happy, okay? So those are gonna cool over here. Now the dessert for this amazing sensuous meal is a panna cotta. Panna cotta is a custard that's set in gelatin that can be almost any flavor that you want. I'm gonna show you one of my favorites. It's a caramel panna cotta. Now the gelatin that we use, um, it's a pure gelatin. It's much, much better than the powdered stuff. So we're gonna soak the gelatin for a few minutes. Okay, now to make caramel, caramel's really no big deal. Caramel is just you know, sugar and water cooked until it turns to caramel. So some water is going to go in a hot pan. The water's job is only there to help us make the caramel. And this will just continue to boil until all the water's gone and the sugar begins to caramelize. This needs about 10 minutes. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a little caramel sauce with this. I'm going to take some orange zest. Actually, let's do it over here and some orange juice. And all I'm gonna do is pour some of this caramel into there, into the juice and the zest to make a little bit of a sauce. I'm also gonna put in a little bit of Ricard or Pernod. It's a little bit of an anise flavor. You could use uh, Drambouille, you can use Cointreau. That's gonna flame off a little bit. I also like just a pinch of salt in these sauces. Now, depending on how deep a caramel flavor you're really looking for from your panna cotta, it's how dark you want to make your caramel. The darker the caramel, the darker the flavor. Okay. That's enough of that. I'm going to make a lighter caramel sauce. I'm going to pour some of this out now. And I'm going to turn this off. All it needs to do is to really stir together. The juice is going to thin the caramel out into a sauce. Mmm, beautiful. Okay, see my caramel? Just the right the temperature, nice light brown. Now caramel will continue to cook, right? So if you turn it off, you say, oh, I'm just gonna turn it off, I think it's good there. It'll keep going because it's so hot. What we're gonna do is pour the cream in. Pour a little bit of cream in. You see how it foams? What we don't want to do is for it to foam over. The foam will subside a little bit. I'm just going to reduce this sauce out until it, it gets to the right consistency for me. This is going to come up to a boil. 
Okay. Cream comes back up to a boil. All the caramel gets melted on the sides. Flavor gets perfect. Pinch of salt in here. Always, always, always just a little bit of salt in my desserts. Flavor comes up underneath it. My gelatin, see, see this is what the gelatin does, is it gets kind of like a jellyfish. So that's just going to finish melting in there. Okay, so we're going to strain this. If there's any gelatin pieces or any bit of caramel that's not quite right, what makes this dish sexy is the texture is just silken and amazing. It's kind of like if you've ever seen silken tofu, the really soft one, that's the texture. This does a couple things. This removes the air bubbles, because the air bubbles will set in there as well. Most of the air bubbles will go out. And then we can pour it directly. Now you could do these in anything. You could do these in little espresso cups. They're really cute in espresso cups. Take a couple candied espresso beans or dust it with some powdered sugar in, uh, in ground espresso. You can even take, if you have a cappuccino machine, do one of these and, and, uh, and do some frothy milk and serve these. Let them set up in a cappuccino cup and froth some milk and put it on top. It's just a little bit of plastic wrap over the top. Now the plastic wrap is going to protect us from getting a skin over the top of this. If we put it right in the refrigerator, the air, the convection of the air would create a skin and that skin is not very sexy at all. So it's going to get covered and go right in the freezer there. Coming to the Culinary Institute of America at Greystone is like coming back home. The school I went to as a young chef when I was 17 is actually in Hyde Park, New York, where the full school for young chefs and entry-level training is. Greystone was put together a few years ago and dropped right into my hometown of St. Helena in the middle of the Napa Valley as a continuing education school, one that you would come to if you've been in a restaurant or a hotel or a resort for a decade, and you're beginning to feel a little bit rusty, looking for some new tips, trying to see what the newest culinary trends are. Unlike the traditional teaching classroom where they'd have all the stoves and 30 students in the class, the open format at Greystone is fantastic. It's really conducive to higher education because as a chef, you're able to focus on the class that you have in front of you, but by assimilation right next to you, there's somebody working on maybe Middle Eastern babkas and souffles over here and baking and pastry and everything, charcuterie. So like a normal commercial kitchen where you're not only working your station, you get a chance to get a feel for all the stations around you. It's an incredible experience for a young chef. And more importantly, as an instructor, like I've been able to do, it's a fantastic way to teach because I'm able to feel all the influence of the entire school at once. You know, as a young student at the Culinary Institute, when I was in Hyde Park, I wasn't exactly the model student. I kind of had my own idea of what I should be learning and the things that I would want to do. I can remember getting called into the president's office because I was president of the Saucier Club. What I wanted to do was to make this classic sauce espagnole the way they did 250 years ago, the way the chef Karem did it. And back then there were sheep heads and whole goats, so I gathered up everything to put it in a pot. Because what I was interested in is knowing what exactly was the flavor of that sauce when this, when this king of chefs, Karem, was actually creating it the first time. So I was always kind of mixing it up. I was only interested in hearing what I could hear, finding a tidbit that could set me apart from somebody else. So. They haven't kicked me out yet, but I did raise quite a ruckus. Nice there. Huh? Hey, Michael. How, how are you? Good. 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 Yeah, you guys have quite an operation going in today. I know. The bread, 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 bread. You got a lot of so. So what you're teaching is artisan, artisan bread. Yeah, basically making bread with starters and sours and uh, whole wheat, multi grains. The way bread was meant to be made. Yeah, I mean, uh, what we did about 30 years ago, <laughs> then decided we could do it much better with the machine. Yeah. I gotta tell you guys, there's nothing more important to, to the wine country than something. You have a glass of wine in your right hand, and it's bread that always goes in your left hand. Where there's great bread, right, and there's a great table, there's always great friends.
same time. Thanks, guys. Thanks. 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 One of my favorite things to cook in the height of summer when tomatoes are perfect is a brodetto. Now what a brodetto is to Italians is what bouillabaisse is to the French. So you need a great tomato for these. They need to get peeled. They don't have to get peeled, I guess. If you have a thin skinned tomato, you could probably not peel them. Uh, peeling them is kind of nice. There's a couple different ways to peel a tomato. If you're going to do the water method, I core them. So the knife goes in. I put my thumb right there in that spot. Hold your knife still and turn the tomato. And that's it, is that perfect? Easy as can be. I take a little bit of a score on this side. Now if you're doing them on the burner, I like the burner method. Especially if I just have to do a couple tomatoes, if there's just a couple of us at the house, you don't gotta take another pot. We'll see which one gets done first. The tomatoes just go in some boiling water. The idea here is just to loosen the skin, just to loosen the skin up a little bit. You'll see the, on the burner method, it's, its job is to do the same thing, to blister the skin. Okay, just set them on your board to cool. All right, two peeling techniques. Then all you have to do is take your knife and peel them through. So to peel these, then you just cut them in half. And then you take and squeeze the seeds out. And this is what you end up with after you, after you chop them. What we're going to do is begin to saute our seafood. We're going to take and season all of these. Everything needs to get seasoned, no matter what you're doing. Clams goes in. I have a hot pan. Shrimp go in. And we're going to sear these about halfway, and then we're going to begin to take them out. Scallops. While these are sautéing, I'm going to chop up some herbs. Now you use any herbs that you like. I like a mixture of tarragon, basil, and a little bit of parsley. Let's see what these guys are doing. Doing fine. Look at that. Perfect. A little bit of color on these guys. Exactly what we're looking for. We're going to give those guys one more second. I'm going to chop up these herbs. You don't hack these guys up and just throw them on the board. You wad them up and forcefully hold them in place and cut them to the desired size. I like my herbs a little bit rough. You know, this has a very kind of roosticella nature to it anyway, this entire dish. So we're going to take these guys out. You see, my scallops are still rare. I want the rest of that cooking to happen in the brodetto. I don't want them to overcook. A little bit of garlic goes in. A little bit more olive oil. Those are great. My garlic gets light brown. Ricard, Pernod, anything like that, very important. We're going to flame this off. Okay, stand back. Oh, Lord, uh, there goes the microphone. Okay, a little bit of Pernod, it flames off. You don't have to flame it, I do a little bit of drama here. I want the alcohol in the Pernod to concentrate. Now we're building flavors as always. So the toasted garlic's in there, the Pernod reduces down, white wine. My clams are starting to open. All right, we got a little cover on those clams to help them open. The mussels, they, they, they come out easy. So we're gonna throw those guys in now. Clams come out. Okay, well those mussels are doing their thing. I'm gonna toss the Caesar salad. So all I do is the whole leaves go in the bowl. Caesar dressing. Okay, you roll up a little bit. They like to be turned. 
I want these all going the same direction in the end. Cold greens, cold dressing. I'm going to set the salads up. I like to set them up in big bowls, straight up, as they were. The big leaves in the back. Now my croutons, my crostino, we take these crostini, we just tuck them in, kind of interchangeably. Oh, crostino overboard. A couple for each. Now all we need at the top of that is a little parmigiano. Okay, we are setting the stage for one very, very sexy meal. Time to pull my mussels out. Mussels are open, clams are open, sauce is reduced, tomatoes go in. In August or September when tomatoes are just at their peak of freshness and ripeness and aroma, I would just barely heat these up and let the tomatoes be fresh and let the sauce be a little more reduced and a little more concentrated. These guys I'm gonna cook for a second and give them just a little bit of, of a moment to release their flavor. They're a little bit firmer. My herb mixture is gonna go in. Now, I don't know any other way to make this any better except to Monte Albert just to finish it with a big pat of butter. This is what I save my butter calories for, for dishes like this. I eat great bread, don't put butter on my bread. For colazione, for breakfast, I don't eat butter on my toast. But in my brodero, just to finish this entire thing with a big old pat of butter. Mmm. Okay, seafood goes back in. You wanna be sure to get all the juices out. That's all that flavor in there we wanna keep. Okay, now the seafood's just gonna heat through. I'm gonna turn those around and around. Now how you serve these is as important as who you eat it with or how it tastes. Serving pieces for these can be fantastic. We have this great marmite. A marmite is kind of a two-handled dish. Or these pans are beautiful enough, you can use these guys as they are. Let's see if I don't dump this on the counter. Oh my God. Just take these guys, whoop, make a little room, push them down in the broth. This other guy over here, push him down in the broth, cover them up a little bit. The lid goes on until just the right moment. Hey, get in there. Mm. So the panna cotta have been in the fridge. They've gotten nice and firm. We bring them out. Here they are. You can always tell if they're firm enough. You give them a jiggle like that and there's no liquid running out. It doesn't turn into a mess. Now there's a couple things you can do, a couple of tricks here. One is I have a little hot water over here. You can just dip these for a second in some hot water if you want to be sure they come out. What that'll do is just melt the outside of the panna cotta just enough for it to pop right out. Take a knife. To go there. I'm going to turn both these guys out. Make a sign of the cross. All right, let's get these guys out. There you go. Look at this. Caramel sauce. And there you have it. 
What do you drink with a brodetto di mare with you and your partner sitting looking romantically into each other's eyes, eating a scallop, wondering what's the perfect sip? Chardonnay. You know why? Because this is a rich dish. There's plenty of scallop and butter and shrimp. Every, every flavor is rich. Chardonnay has enough acid and enough oak to carry the flavor. And the Chardonnay by itself is a sexy dish. Michael Chiarello's Napa is funded by... Sunkist, fresh citrus taste, cooking with Sunkist throughout the day. Sunkist, our promise, your inspiration. By Salton, innovative products for a healthy today and tomorrow, bringing you the family of George Foreman's lean, mean, fat-reducing grilling machine. Salton, the secret to indoor grilling. And by Wolf. Makers of ovens, cooktops, and ranges to fuel a passion for cooking. And by all-clad metal crafters.